Wind, Sand and Stars by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry Chapter 1 The Craft In 1926 I was enrolled as student airline pilot by the Latakoua Company, the predecessors of Aeropostale, now Air France, in the operation of the line between Toulouse in southwestern France and Dakar in French West Africa. I was learning the craft, undergoing an apprenticeship served by all young pilots before they were allowed to carry the mails. We took ships up on trial spins, made meek little hops between Toulouse and Perpignan, and had dreary lessons in meteorology in a freezing hangar. We lived in fear of the mountains of Spain, over which we had yet to fly, and in awe of our elders. These veterans were to be seen in the field restaurant, gruff, not particularly approachable, and inclined somewhat to condescension when giving us the benefit of their experience. When one of them landed, rain-soaked and behind schedule, from Edicond or Casablanca, and one of us asked humble questions about his flight, the very curtness of his replies on these tempestuous days was matter enough out of which to build a fabulous world filled with snares and pitfalls, with cliffs suddenly looming out of fog and whirling air currents of a strength to uproot cedars. Black dragons guarded the mouths of the valleys and clusters of lightning crowned the crests, for our elders were always at some pains to feed our reverence. But from time to time, one or another of them, eternally to be revered, would fail to come back. I remember once, a homecoming of Paris, he who was later to die in a spur of the Pyrenees. He came into the restaurant, sat down at the common table, and went stolidly at his food, shoulders still bowed by the fatigue of his recent trial. It was at the end of one of those foul days, when from end to end of the line the skies are filled with dirty weather, when the mountains seem to a pilot to be wallowing in slime like exploded cannon on the decks of an antique man-o'-war. I stared at Berry, swallowed my saliva, and ventured after a bit to ask if he had had a hard flight. Berry bent over his plate in frowning absorption, could not hear me. In those days we flew open ships and thrust our heads out round the windshield, in bad weather, to take our bearings. The wind that whistled in our ears was a long time clearing out of our heads. Finally, Barry looked up, seemed to understand me, to think back to what I was referring to, and suddenly he gave a bright laugh. This brief burst of laughter from a man who laughed a little startled me. For a moment his weary being was bright with it, but he spoke no word, lowered his head, and went on, chewing in silence. And in that dismal restaurant, surrounded by the simple government clerks who sat there repairing the wear and tear of their humble daily tasks, my broad-shouldered messmate seemed to me strangely noble. Beneath his rough hide I could discern the angel who had vanquished the dragon. The night came when it was my turn to be called to the field manager's room. He said, You leave tomorrow. I stood motionless, waiting for him to dismiss me. After a moment of silence, he added, I take it you know the regulations? In those days, the motor was not what it is today. It would drop out, for example, without warning, and with a great rattle, like the crash of crockery. And one would simply throw in one's hand. There was no hope of refuge on the rocky crust of Spain. Here, we used to say, when your motor goes, your ship goes too. An airplane, of course, can be replaced. Still, the important thing was to avoid a collision with the range, and blind flying through a sea of clouds in the mountain zones was subject to the severest penalties. A pilot in trouble who buried himself in the white cotton wool of the clouds might all unseeing run straight into a peak. This was why, that night, the deliberate voice repeated insistently its warning. Navigating by compass in a sea of clouds over Spain is all very well. It is very dashing, but... And I was struck by the graphic image. 
but you want to remember that below the sea of clouds lies eternity. And suddenly that tranquil cloud world, that world so harmless and simple that one sees below on rising out out of the clouds, took on, in my eyes, a new quality. That peaceful world became a pitfall. I imagined the immense white pitfall spread beneath me. Below it rained not what one might think, not the agitation of men, not the living tumult and bustle of cities, but a silence more absolute than in the clouds, a peace even more final. This viscous whiteness became in my mind the frontier between the real and the unreal, between the known and the unknowable. Already I was beginning to realize that a spectacle has no meaning except it be seen through the glass of a culture, a civilization, a craft. Mountaineers, too, know the sea of clouds, yet it does not seem to them the fabulous curtain it is to me. When I left that room, I was filled with the childish pride. Now it was my turn to take on at dawn the responsibility of a cargo of passengers and the African males. But at the same time, I felt very meek. I felt myself ill-prepared for this responsibility. Spain was poor in emergency fields. We had no radio, and I was troubled lest, when I got into difficulty, I should not know where to hunt a landing place. Staring at the aridity of my maps, I could see no help in them, and so, with a heart full of shyness and pride, I fled to spend this night of vigil with my friend, Guillaume. Guillaume had been over the route before me. He knew all the dodges by which one got hold of the keys to Spain. I should have to be initiated by Guillaume. When I walked in, he looked up and smiled. I know all about it, he said. How do you feel? He went to a cupboard and came back with glasses and a bottle of port, still smiling. We'll drink to it, don't worry. It's easier than you think. Guillaume exuded confidence the way a lamp gives off light. He was himself later on to break the record for postal crossings in the Andes and the South Atlantic. On this night, sitting in his shirt sleeves, his, arm fold his arms folded in the lamplight, smiling the most heartening of smiles, he said to me simply, You'll be bothered from time to time by storms, fog, snow. When you are, think of those who went through it before you and say to yourself, What they could do, I can do. I spread out my maps and asked him hesitantly if he would mind going over the hop with me. And there, bent over in the lamplight, shoulder to shoulder with the veteran, I felt a sort of schoolboy peace. But what a strange lesson in geography I was given. Guillaume did not teach Spain to me. He made the country my friend. He did not talk about provinces or peoples or livestock. Instead of telling me about Guadis, He spoke of three orange trees on the edge of the town. Beware of those trees. Better mark them on the map. And those three orange trees seemed to me thenceforth higher than the Sierra Nevada. He did not talk about Lorca, but about a humble farm near Lorca, a living farm with its farmer and the farmer's wife. And this tiny, this remote couple living a thousand miles from where we sat took on a universal importance. Settled on the slope of a mountain, they watched like light lighthouse keepers beneath the stars, ever on the lookout to succor men. The details that we drew up from oblivion, from their inconceivable remoteness, no geographer had been concerned to explore. Because it washed the banks of great cities, the Ebro River was of interest to mapmakers. But what had they to do with that brook, running secretly through the water weeds to the west of Motril? that brook nourishing a mere score or two of flowers. Careful of that brook. It breaks up the whole field. Mark it on your map. Ah, I was to remember that servant serpent in the grass near Motril. It looked like nothing at all, and its faint murmur sang to no more than a few frogs, but it slept with one eye open. Stretching its length along the grasses in the paradise of that emergency landing field, it lay in wait for me, a thousand miles from where I sat. Given the chance, it would transform me into a flaming candelabra. And those thirty valorous sheep, ready to charge me on the slope of a hill, 
Now that I knew about them, I could brace myself to meet them. You think the meadow empty, and suddenly, bang! There are thirty sheep in your wheels. An astounded smile was all I could summon in the face of so cruel a threat. Little by little, under the lamp, the Spain of my map became a sort of fairyland. The crosses I marked to indicate safety zones and traps were so many buoys and beacons. I charted the farmer, the furdy sheep, the brook. And exactly where she stood, I set a buoy to mark the shepherdess, forgotten by the geographers. When I left Guillaume on that freezing winter night, I felt the need of a brisk walk. I turned up my coat collar, and as I strode among the indifferent passers-by, I was escorting a fervor as tender as if I had just fallen in love. To be brushing past these strangers with that marvelous secret in my heart filled me with pride. I seemed to myself a sentinel standing guard over a sleep sleeping camp. These passers-by knew nothing about me, yet it was to me that, in their mail pouches, they were about to confide the weightiest cares of their hearts and their trade. Into my hands they were about to entrust their hopes, and I, muffled up in my cloak, walked among them like a shepherd though they were unaware of my solicitude. Nor were they receiving any of those messages now being dispatched to me by the night. For this snowstorm that was gathering and, uh, and that was to burden my first flight concerned my frail flesh, not theirs. What could they know of those stars that one by one were going out? I alone was in the confidence of the stars. To me alone, news was being sent of the enemy's position before the hour of battle. My footfall rang in a universe that was not theirs. These messages of such grave concern were reaching me as I walked between rows of lighted shop windows, and those windows on that night seemed a display of all that was good on earth, of a paradise of sweet things. In the sight of all this happiness I tasted the proud intoxication of renunciation, I was a warrior in danger. What meaning could they have for me, these flashing crystals meant for men's festivities, these lamps whose glow was to shelter men's meditations, these cozy furs out of which were to emerge pathetically beautiful, solicitous faces? I was still wrapped in the aura of friendship, dazed like a little child on Christmas Eve, expectant of surprise and palpitatingly prepared for happiness. And yet, already, I was soaked in spray. A male pilot. I was already nippling the bitter pulp of night flight. It was three in the morning when they woke me. I thrust the shutters open with a dry snap, saw that rain was falling on the town, and got soberly into my harness. A half hour later I was out on the pavement, shining with rain, sitting on my little valise, and waiting for the bus that was to pick me up. So many other flyers before me on their day of ordination had undergone this humble wait with beating heart. Finally I saw the old-fashioned vehicle come round the corner and heard its tinny rattle. Like those who had gone before me, I squeezed in between a sleepy customs guard and a few glum government clerks. The bus smelled musty, smelled of the dust of government offices into which the life of a man sinks into, as into quicksand. It stopped every five hundred yards to take on another scrivener, another guard, another inspector. Those in the bus who had already gone back to sleep responded with a vague grunt to the greeting of the newcomer, while he crowded in as well as he was able, and instantly fell asleep himself. We jolted mournfully over the uneven pavements of Toulouse. In the midst of these men, who in the rain and the breaking day were about to take up again their dreary diurnal tasks, their red tape, their monotonous lives. Morning after morning, greeted by the growl of the customs guard, shaken out of his sleep by his arrival, by the gruff irritability of clerk or inspector, one mail pilot or another got into this bus and was, for the moment, indistinguishable from these bureaucrats. But as the street lamps moved by, as the field grew nearer and nearer, the old omnibus rattling along, lost little by little its reality and became a grey chrysalis from which one emerged, transfigured. Morning after morning a flyer sat here and felt of a sudden, somewhere inside, the vulnerable man subjected to his neighbor's surliness, the stirring of the pilot of the Spanish and African males, 
the birth of him who, three hours later, was to confront in the lightnings the dragon of the mountains, and who, four hours afterwards, having vanquished it, would be free to decide between a detour over the sea and a direct assault upon the Alcoy range, would be free to deal with storm, with mountain, with ocean. And thus, every morning, each pilot before me, in his time, had been lost in the anonymity of daybreak beneath the dismal winter sky of Toulouse, and each one, transfigured by this old omnibus, had felt the birth within him of the sovereign who, five hours later, leaving behind him the rains and snows of the north, repudiating winter, had throttled down his motor and begun to drift earthward in the summer air beneath the shining sun of Alicante. The old omnibus has vanished, but its austerity, its discomfort, still live in my memory. It was a proper symbol of the apprenticeship we had to, had to serve before we might possess the stern joys of our craft. Everything about it was intensely serious. I remember three years later, though hardly ten words were spoken, learning in that bus of the death of L'Ecrivain, one of those hundred pilots who, on a day or, night of, or a night of fog, have retired for eternity. It was four in the morning, and the same silence was abroad when we heard the field manager, invisible in the darkness, address the inspector. De Crevant didn't land at Casablanca last night. Ah, said the inspector. Ah. Torn from his dream, he had made an effort to wake up, to display his seal, and added, Is that so? Couldn't he get through? Did he come back? And, in the dead darkness of the omnibus, the answer came, no. We waited to hear the rest, but no word sounded, and as the seconds fell it became more and more evident that that no would be followed by no further word. It was eternal and without appeal that L'Ecrivain not only had not landed at Casablanca, but would never again land anywhere. And so, at daybreak, on the morning of my first flight with the males, I went through the sacred rites of the craft, and I felt the self-confidence oozing out of me as I stared through the windows at the macadam shining and reflecting back the street lights. Over the pools of water I could see great palms of wind running. And I fought my first flight with the males. Really, this is not my lucky day. I raised my eyes and looked at the, at the inspector. Would you call this bad weather? I asked. He threw a weary glance out of the window. Doesn't prove anything, he growled finally. And I wondered how one could tell bad weather. The night before, with a single smile, Guillaume had wiped out all the evil omens with which the veterans overwhelmed us. But they came back into my memory. I feel sorry for the man who doesn't know the whole line pebble by pebble if he runs into a snowstorm. Oh yes, I pity the fellow. Our elders, who had their prestige to think of, all bobbed their heads solemnly and looked at us with embarrassing sympathy as if they were pitying a flock of condemned sheep. For how many of us had this old omnibus served as refuge in its day? 60. A.D. I looked about me. Luminous points glowed in the darkness, cigarettes punctuated by the humble meditations of worn old clerks. How many of us had they escorted through the rain on a journey from which there was no coming back? I heard them talking to one another in murmurs and whispers. They talked about illness, money, shabby domestic cares. Their talk painted the walls of the dismal prison in which these men had locked themselves up. And suddenly, I had a vision of the face of destiny. Old bureaucrat, my comrade, it is not you who are to blame. No one ever helped you to escape. You, like a termite, built your peace by blocking up with cement every chink and cranny through which the light might pierce. You rolled yourself up into a ball in your genteel security, in routine, in the stifling conventions of provincial life raising a modest rampart against the winds and the tides and the stars. You have chosen not to be perturbed by great problems, having trouble enough to forget your own fate as man. You are not the dweller upon an errant planet, and do not ask yourself questions to which there are no answers. You are a petty bourgeois of Toulouse. Nobody grasped you by the shoulder while there was still time. 
Now the clay of which you were shaped has dried and hardened, and naught in you will ever awaken the sleeping musician, the poet, the astronomer, that possibly inhabited you in the beginning. The squall has ceased to be a cause of my complaint. The magic of the craft has opened for me a world in which I shall confront, within two hours, the black dragons and the crown crests of a coma of blue lightnings, and when night has fallen, I, delivered, shall read my course in the stars. Thus I went through my professional baptism, and I began to fly the mails. For the most part, the flights were without incident. Like sea divers, we sank peacefully into the depths of our element. Flying, in general, seemed to us easy. When the skies are filled with black vapors, when fog and sand and sea are confounded in a brew in which they become indistinguishable, when gleaming flashes wheel treacherously in these skyey swamps, the pilot purges himself of the phantoms at a single stroke. He lights his lamps. He brings sanity into his house as into a lonely cottage on a fearsome heath. And the crew travel a sort of submarine route in a lighted chamber. Pilot, mechanic, and radio operator are shut up in what, what might be a laboratory. They are obedient to the play of dial hands, not to the unrolling of the landscape. Out of doors the mountains are immersed in tenebrous darkness. But they are no longer mountains, they are invisible powers whose approach must be computed. The operator sits in the light of his lamp, dutifully setting down figures. The mechanic ticks off points on his chart, the pilot swerves in response to the drift of the mountains as quickly as he sees that the summits he intends to pass to the left have deployed straight ahead of him, in a silence and secrecy as of military preparations. And below on the ground, the watchful radio men in their shacks take down submissively in their notebooks the dictation of their comrade in the air. 12.40 a.m. En route 2.30. All well. So the crew fly on, with no thought they are in motion, like night over the sea. They are very far from the earth, from towns, from trees. The motors fill the lighted chamber with a quiver that changes its substance. The clock ticks on. The dials, the radio lamps, the various hands and needles go through their invisible alchemy. From second to second, these mysterious stirrings, a few muffled words and concentrated tenseness, contribute to the end result, and when the hour is at hand, the pilot may glue his forehead to the window with perfect assurance. Out of oblivion the gold has been smelted, there it gleams in the lights of the airport. And yet we have all known flights when, of a sudden, each for himself, it has seemed to us that we have crossed the border of the world of reality, when, only a couple of hours from port, we have felt ourselves more distant from it than we should feel if we were in India. When there has come a premonition of an incursion into a forbidden world whence it was going to be infinitely difficult to return. Thus, when Mermoz first crossed the South Atlantic in a hydroplane, as day was dying, he ran afoul of the black hole region off Africa. Straight ahead of him were the tails of tornadoes rising minute by minute gradually higher, rising as a wall is built, and then the night came down upon these prelim preliminaries and swallowed them up. And when, an hour later, he slipped under the clouds, he came out into a fantastic kingdom. Great black waterspouts had reared themselves seemingly in the immobility of temple pillars. Swollen at their tops, they were supporting the squat and lowering arch of the tempest. But through the rifts in the arch, there fell slabs of light, and the full moon sent her radiant beams between the pillars down upon the frozen tiles of the sea. Through these uninhabited ruins, Mermos made his way, gliding slantwise from one channel of light to the next, circling round those giant pillars in which there must have rumbled the upsurge of the, upsurge of the sea, flying for four hours through these corridors of moonlight toward the exit from the temple and this spectacle was so overwhelming that only after he had got through the black hole did Mermos awaken to the fact that he had not been afraid. I remember, for my part, another of those hours in which a pilot finds suddenly that he has slipped beyond the confines of this world. All that night 
the radio messages sent from the ports in the Sahara concerning our position had been inaccurate, and my radio operator, Neri, and I had been drawn out of our course. Suddenly, seeing the gleam of water at the bottom of a crevasse of fog, I tacked sharply in the direction of the coast, but it was by then impossible for us to say how long we had been flying towards the high seas. Nor were we certain of making the coast, for our fuel was probably low. And even so, once we had reached it, we would still have to make port, after the moon had set. We had no means of angular orientation, were already deafened, and were bit by bit growing blind. The moon, like a pallid ember, began to go out in the banks of fog. Overhead the sky was filling with clouds, and we flew thenceforth between cloud and fog in a world voided of all substance and all light. The ports that signaled us had given up trying to tell us where we were. No bearings, no bearings, was all their message, for our voice reached them from everywhere and nowhere. With sinking hearts, Nilly and I leaned out, he on his side and I on mine to see if, any, if anything, anything at all, was distinguishable in the void. Already our tired eyes were seeing things, errant signs, delusive flashes, phantoms. And suddenly, when already we were in despair, low on the horizon a brilliant point was unveiled on our port bow. A wave of joy went through me. Nelly leaned forward, and I could hear him singing. It could not but be the beacon of an airport, for after dark the whole Sahara goes black and forms a great dead expanse. That light twinkled for a space and then went out. We had been steering for a star which was visible for a few minutes only, just before setting on the horizon between the layer of fog and the clouds. Then other stars took up the game, and with a sort of dogged hope we set our course for each of them in turn. Each time that a light lingered a while, we performed the same crucial experiment. Neri would send his message to the airport at Cisnero, beacon in view, put out your light, and flash three times. And Cisnero would put out its beacon and flash three times, while the hard light at which we gazed would not, incorruptible star so much as wink. And despite our dwindling fuel, we continued to nibble at the golden bait, which each time seemed more surely the true light of a beacon, was each time a promise of a landing and of life, and we had each time to change our star. And with that we knew ourselves to be lost in interplanetary space among a thousand inaccessible planets, we who sought only the one veritable planet, our own. That planet on which alone we should find our familiar countryside, the houses of our friends, our treasures on which alone we should find. Let me draw the picture that took shape before my eyes. It will seem to you childish, but even in the midst of danger, a man retains his human concerns. I was thirsty, and I was hungry. If we did, if we did find Cisnero, we should refuel and carry on to Casablanca. And there we should come down in the, school, in the cool of daybreak, free to idle the hours away. Neri and I would go into town. We would go to a little pub, already open despite the early hour, safe and sound. Neri and I would sit down at table and laugh at the night of danger as we ate our warm rolls and drank our bowls of coffee and hot milk. We would receive this matutinal gift at the hands of life. Even as an old peasant woman recognizes her god in a painted image in a childish medal, in a chaplet, so life would speak to us in its humblest language in order that we understand. The joy of living, I say, was summed up for me in the remembered sensation of that first burning, burning and aromatic swallow, that mixture of milk and coffee and bread by which men hold communion with tranquil pastures, exotic plantations and golden harvests, communion with the earth. Amidst all these stars, there was but one that could make itself significant for us by composing this aromatic bowl that was its daily gift at dawn. And from that earth of men, that earth docile to the reaping of grain and the harvesting of the grape, bearing its rivers asleep in their fields, its villages clinging to their hillsides, 
our ship was separated by astronomical distances. All the treasures of the world were summed up in a grain of dust now blown far out of our path by the very destiny itself of dust and of the orbs of the night. And Neri still prayed to the stars. Suddenly he was pounding my shoulder. On the bit of paper he held forth impatiently to me, I read, All well, magnificent news. I waited with beating heart while he scribbled the half-dozen words that were to save us. At last he put this grace of heaven into my hands. It was stated from Casablanca, which we had left the night before. Delayed in transmission, it had suddenly found us, more than a thousand miles away, suspended between cloud and fog, lost at sea. It was sent by the government representative at the airport, and it said, Monsieur de Saint-Exupéry, I am obliged to recommend that you be disciplined at Paris for having flown too close to the hangars on leaving Casablanca. It was true that I had done this. It was also th true that this man was performing his duty with, ir with irritability. I should have been humiliated if this reproach had been addressed to me in an airport, but it me reached me where it had no right to reach me. Among these two rare stars, on this bed of fog, in this menacing savor of the sea, it burst like a detonation. Here we were with our fate in our hands, the fate of the males and of the ship. We had trouble enough to try to keep alive, and this man was purging his petty rancor against us. But Neri and I were far from nettled. What we felt was a vast and sudden jubilation. Here it was we who were masters, and this man was letting us know it. The impudent little corporal, not to have looked at our stripes and seen that we had been promoted captain, to intrude into our musings when we were suddenly, solemnly taking our constitutional between Sagittarius and the Great Bear, when the only thing we could be concerned with, the only thing of our order of magnitude, was this appointment we were missing with the moon. The immediate duty, the only duty of the planet whence this man's message came, was to furnish us accurate figures for our computations among the stars. And its figures had been false. This being so, the planet had only to hold its tongue. Nelly scribbled, Instead of wasting their time with this nonsense, they would do better to haul us back to Cisneroll, if they can. By they, he meant all the peoples of the globe, with their parliaments, their senates, their navies, their armies, their emperors. We reread the message from that man, mad enough to imagine that he had business with us, and tacked in the direction of Mercury. It was by purest chance that we were saved. I had given up all thought of making Cisnol, and had set my course at right angles to the coastline, in the hope that thus we might avoid coming down at sea when our fuel ran out. Meanwhile, however, I was in the belly of a dense fog, so that even with land below, it was not going to be easy to set the ship down. The situation was so clear that already I was shrugging my shoulders ruefully, when Neri passed me a second message, which, an hour earlier, would have been our salvation. Cisneroux, it said, has deigned to communicate with us. Cisneroux says, 216, doubtful. Well, that helped. Cisno was no longer swallowed up in space. It was actually out there, on our left, almost within reach. But how far away? Neri and I talked it over briefly, decided it was too late to try for it, since that might mean missing the coast, and Neri replied, Only one hour of fuel left, continuing on 9-3. But the airports, one by one, had been waking each other up. Into our dialogue broke the voices of Akadir, Casablanca, Dakar. The radio stations at each, at each of these towns had warmed in, warned the airports, and the ports had flashed the news to our comrades. Bit by bit they were gathering round us as round a sickbed. Vain warmth, but human warmth, after all. Helpless concern, but affectionate at any rate. And suddenly into this conclave burst Toulouse, the headquarters of the line three thousand miles away, worried, along with the rest. Toulouse broke in without a word of greeting, simply to say sharply, Your reserve tank's bigger than standard. You have two hours fuel left. 
proceed to Cisnero. There is no need of nights like the one just described to make the airline pilot find new meanings in old appearances. The scene that strikes the passenger as commonplace is from the very moment of taking off animated with a powerful magic for the crew. It is the duty of the ship's captain to make port. Cost what it may. The sight of massing clouds is no, more, no mere spectacle to him. It is a matter of concern to his physical being, and to his mind it means a set of problems. Before he is off the ground he has taken its measure, and between him and it a bond is formed, which is a veritable language. There is a peak ahead, still distant. The pilot will not reach it before another hour of flight in the night. What is to be the significance of that peak? On a night of full moon, it will be a useful landmark. In fainter moon glow, it will be a bit of wreckage thrown in shadow, dangerous but marked clearly enough by the lights of villages. But, if the pilot flies blind, has bad luck in correcting his drift, is dubious about his position, that peak begins to stir with a strange life, and its threat fills the breath of the night sky in the same way as a single mine, drifting at the will of the current, can render the whole of the ocean a danger. The face of the sea is as variable as that of the earth. To passengers the storm is invisible. Seen from a great height, the waves have no relief and the packets of fog have no movement. The surface of the sea appears to be covered with great white motionless palm trees, palms marked with ribs and seams stiff in a sort of frost. The sea is like a splintered mirror, but the hydroplane pilot knows there is no landing there. The hours during which a man flies over this mirror are hours in which there is no assurance of the possession of anything in the world. These palms beneath the plain are so many poisoned flowers. And even when the flight is an easy one, made under a shining sun, the pilot navigating at some point on the line is not gazing upon a scene. These colors of earth and sky these traces of wind over the face of the sea, these clouds golden in the afterglow, are not objects of the pilot's admiration, but of his cogitation. He looks to them to tell him the direction of the wind, or the progress of the storm, and the quality of the night to come. Even as the peasant strolling about his domain is able to foresee in a thousand signs the coming of the spring, the threat of frost, a promise of rain, so all that happens in the sky signals to the pilot the oncoming snow, the expectancy of fog, or the peace of a blessed night. The machine, which at first blush seems a means of isolating man from the great problems of nature, actually plunges him more deeply into them. As for the peasant, so for the pilot, dawn and twilight become events of consequence. His essential problems are set him by the mountain, the sea, the wind. Alone before the vast tribunal of this tempestuous sky, the pilot defends his males and debates on terms of equality with those three elemental divinities. The mail pouches for which he is responsible are stowed away in the afterhold. They constitute the dogma of the religion of his craft, the torch which, in this aerial race, is passed from runner to runner. What matter, though they hold, what matter though they hold but the scribblings of tradesmen and nondescript lovers? The interests, which it, the interests which dictated them may very well not be worth the embrace of man and storm, but I know what they become once they have been entrusted to the crew, taken over, as the phrase is. The crew care not a rap for banker or tradesman. If some day the crew are hooked by a cliff, it will not have been in the interest of tradespeople that they will have died, but in obedience to orders which ennoble the sacks of mail once they are on board ship. What concerns us is not even the orders. It is the men they cast in their mold. <laughs>